Hey, Jess Teen Stress, I'm Abba Shrestha, and welcome back to our Beyond the Brain series, where we interview with health professionals and experts about mental health in order to get a deeper insight of different aspects of stress and mental well-being. Today, I'm here with psychologist and author, Dr. Tracy Packham Alawai. Dr. Tracy, can you please start off by telling me a little bit about yourself? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's really fun. And as you as we were chatting a little bit beforehand, I know we've been trying to make it work. So I'm really glad we could do this together. Um, a little bit of background about me. I uh, am a PhD. I'm also a licensed psychologist. Uh, I'm a professor at a university here in Florida. I have written 15 books. Some of them look at ADHD. Some look at memory. And in general, my whole research interest is to look at how we can manage our mental health and be a healthy and effective version of ourselves. That's awesome. I, I love that. So can you please share a little bit about your journey in becoming your an award-winning psychologist and researcher and what sparked your interest in the field of memory in the brain? Yeah, such a great question, and I appreciate your interest in that. Um, I really became interested in being a psychologist in high school when we had a career day and a psychologist came and shared a little bit about some of their work, and I thought that sounds really amazing. And my journey was a little indirect in that uh, when I first did my PhD, it was in cognitive psychology, so I was looking more at how we use language and how language can shape the way we think. Um, and then as I began to do more research, I was the recipient of some government-funded grants where I was looking at learning. And so that started me off with a very young population with five-year-olds. And we had this a huge national study looking at five-year-olds across the country and understanding how their brain works and how they can be better students in the classroom. And as I began to share my research, uh, different healthcare professionals, people who work with ADHD, with autism, with mental health, we're all interested in our overlapping interests. And so it really was a great opportunity for me to collaborate with people from different types of uh, skills and professional backgrounds. And so that has really driven a lot of my research interests is where my interest started off in memory and is still interested in memory. But I get to share that interest and that passion with other people who have interest in different, you know, again, whether it's ADHD, whether it's anxiety, whether it's stress. So it, it creates a nice network and community of us all working together. And then how do you think the understanding of memory processes or like what you're talking about, like ADHD and the things that you know about contribute to our understanding of teen mental health? And are there specific challenges in this age group that your research hasn't covered? Yeah, also such a, an important question. I think the research is growing, especially in the population where there's, I would say, maybe even 10 or 20 years. If you think about the professors who are conducting the research, they tended to look at the sample that's most accessible, and that tended to be college students. So now access to different populations is far easier, especially when we look at online data collection mechanisms and so on. So we can understand a bit more about our, our, our teenagers and how the brain develops and mental health. So I would say that the research is growing. We do know that the brain, especially the front of the brain, known as the prefrontal cortex is still developing. And so oftentimes in the teenage brain, that is a time that's characterized sometimes by what we what we it can be perceived as impulsive decisions, but really it's because this part of the brain is still forming. So we're still learning what our boundaries are, what are what's a healthy decision for us, and we're formulating that opinion. I would say that in the last five years, that decision making has become even more challenging. Because if you think about it, pre-social media, or even pre-COVID, where you know TikTok kind of skyrocketed and social media platforms in general skyrocketed um, through COVID because we were so physically isolated from each other. So that was the means in which we connected. And so now you have these platforms that also make it more challenging in some ways, but also more helpful in other ways for how we develop our sense of identity and our sense of self. And so my own research was done pre-TikTok uh, in this area of social media, but we were looking at uh, high school students, teenagers, and we did find a link between some positive aspects of social media, that that connection can create a sense of empathy where you can say, oh, I didn't realize someone else was going through something similar to me. 
the negative is that we do see a growing body of research to show that, for example, a study came up from Oxford University that found that when teenagers feel low and they seek out a social media platform, that low feeling or that depressed feeling is intensified. So instead of thinking, I feel kind of down, I should just get on, you know, get on my social media and see what's going on. Instead of it lifting them up, as they might think, it actually depresses them even more. So it's kind of counterintuitive sometimes to what we think we're doing. So the research can be really helpful. Once we know that, we can maybe make a healthier choice. We can say, hey, I'm feeling low. Maybe I just want to do some other things that I know research would show is helpful. Maybe I step outside. Maybe I call a friend and have that social connection, that face-to-face -face or that one-on-one -on -one connection rather than, you know, kind of that death scroll that can get us can get us all down. So it's very interesting, actually. I did not know that at all. So as an associate editor of the Educational and Developmental Psychologist Journal, how do you see the intersection between educational psychology and the mental health of teenagers? And again, I think that's a growing uh, connection that we're seeing where educators, so classroom teachers, um, are beginning to recognize the role that mental health is playing in the classroom. So we are familiar with test anxiety, and that's probably the easiest and most commonly recognized form that mental health plays a role, that test anxiety can really impact performance and ultimately grades of the, of the individual. But now educators are beginning to recognize that even social anxiety can make a difference. Uh, the way we um, form our identities and our social networks in person can also make a difference. Uh, the you know things like we think of bullying behavior, we think of even mirroring so there's research to show that if if we are highly empathetic or i think the phrase is hsp highly sensitive persons so people like that are more susceptible to negative emotion so they may mirror that negative emotion in the people around them so again i think that that can impact the classroom it can impact their functioning within the school setting and teachers are becoming more aware. And it's important that we become more aware about that as ourselves so that the student knows that, hey, if I'm someone that is a bit more sensitive, uh, an HSPT, or that's how I identify, then I need to protect myself a little bit more. I need to make sure that I don't. I surround myself with people who are healthy, who are positive, who are uplifting, so that I'm not brought down. Given your expertise, what advice would you offer to parents and educators in supporting their mental health in teenagers, especially considering the challenge they face today? Uh, such a great question. And I would, first of all, look at the research on um, praise to use this as an example. And it, it sounds like it may not be related, but the reason I think it's so critical is because there's research to show that there are two ways we can praise a, a child. We can say, oh, you are so amazing. So you praise the person, person raised praise, or we can praise their effort like, wow, I see you working really hard. And it sounds like such a small difference, but the research shows that the impact is incredibly different. So when we praise the person, that person begins to take their behavior as their identity. It thinks like, oh, I'm smart. That's me. That's how I identify. I am a smart person, which sounds positive, except when it's not. So when that person, for example, fails a test or doesn't do as well as they perceive, then their whole identity is uh, struggles as a result. It's shattered. They feel like I am no longer that smart person. And it also goes to this idea of agency. If you are that person, you don't have control on the outcome anymore. And this is one of the precursors to depression. In contrast, if you praise the effort, like, wow, I saw you working really hard, or I'm sorry you didn't do as well on your grades or this test, what can you do to change the outcome? So you shift it away from the person to your effort, and it gives you agency. You can say, oh, you're right, I, I kind of didn't study that hard, or I kind of thought I knew more than I should, but it lets you feel like I can make a change, I can do something. And so for parents, and for educators, this distinction is really important in the context of mental health. If you say you're a sad person or you're an anxious person, it can ultimately make us feel like we don't have control over emotions. This is us. This defines us. When that's not the case, our emotions are a real thing, but we do have a choice over our behavior. So while we can feel sad, we can feel angry, we can feel happy, how we choose to respond is our choice. So we might say, I do feel angry. I'm really mad that my friend said or did this. I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to allow myself to be angry. 
But what's my action? What is the positive thing that I can choose to do? Maybe I want to ignore it because I don't want to have that conversation now. Maybe I want to have the conversation in an open, healthy way by saying, hey, my feelings, you know, I didn't feel great when you said that. I'd prefer if you don't say these negative things about me because they're not true. So it creates a space to have a conversation rather than feeling like that emotion is defining you. So that recognition, both for the individual as well as the parent to recognize and guide the child is really important. And what do you think in today's generation, today's current state of teen mental health and stress is similar or different compared to when you were a teenager? I think that there's so much more awareness when I was growing up. So I grew up in an Asian family and you have the, you know, the cultural expectations there too. And, you know, as a female too, there are different expectations. And I think now there is so much awareness that things like this, the podcast that you're doing, it's so amazing, the resource that you offer to, you know, to the people uh, that you, that are connected to you. And I didn't have that growing up and I wish I did. So, you know, if you have a thought, you don't know, is this, what is, is this me? Am I the only one that's feeling that? And sometimes it's easier to get stuck in a loop, whereas now I feel like there's resources where you can feel that solidarity. You can feel like, okay, I'm not alone. Someone else is going through that. But not only do you have that solidarity, solidarity there are also resources like what you're offering to your community. So I think on both levels, it's incredibly helpful for today's current uh, teenagers to have these resources. And I, I do hope that people would be able to, you know, check out your podcast to look at these kinds of resources and really uh, grow as a healthy person as a result of those. And how do you think that your coping mechanisms have changed from when you're a teenager to now? Or is there any coping mechanisms that you took with you from your childhood and you took with you to adulthood? Yeah, such a great question. And I'd like to think that I don't, I, I've, I've developed more healthy coping mechanisms now. Um, I used to run a lot. I still run a lot. So that is one thing that I, that I've kept because I, it, you know, running is a great stress relief for me. Uh, and this research shows that too, but I would say the, the biggest change that I've noticed in my coping mechanism is twofold. One, I allow myself to feel the emotion. And I would say that this is a journey that I've uh, discovered very recently in my adult life. So, and again, I think that's why it's so incredible that these resources are available now for teenagers too. But to recognize that, hey, if I am angry, I wanna, I'll set a timer. I, I'm gonna be angry. I'm gonna say the things that are making me angry or the things that are making me sad. But when the timer goes, I have to make a, a positive action. What is my behavior that I want to do now? And I would say that is a far healthier way than I used to be. Uh, you know, it's easy for us to overthink or ruminate where you keep thinking, you know, why did I say what happened why and we kind of get down this loop of the whys and it's hard to disengage and so that is a journey certainly that I didn't have as a teenager that now I'm more intentional about practicing and saying let myself feel the emotion and then act in a positive way so taking a step back towards what we we're talking about earlier psychology what do you think is a really big misconception on psychology or to psychologists is, uh, do you feel like a uh, misconception from people on the outside looking in? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think a big misconception could be that um, it's easy to label everything as a disorder. So we take something and we move it to the extreme. So while the awareness of, say, something like ADHD or OCD or depression, anxiety, it's, it's really healthy that we now know more about the symptoms, but sometimes we can over pathologize it. We can say, oh my gosh, I'm so depressed when we may feel sad, but it's not a clinical level of depression. Or we might say things like, oh my gosh, I'm so OCD when we like order, but it's not at a clinical level. And so I think having that distinction is important too. And if you think about it, even in the context of relationships, it's easy to pathologize your partner. It, it may be easy to say, oh, that person is such a narcissist. They may be showing, and this goes back to the idea of the identity versus the behavior. So that person may be showing some behaviors that are narcissistic. That doesn't necessarily make it a clinical definition of a personality, a narcissistic personality disorder. And I think that could be a misconception that we take the characteristics and then we magnify it and we look at it more from the disorder perspective. 
And then what's a really big misconception you think that people have on mental health? Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I think despite the awareness that we have, people will, there is a general misconception that I can't talk about my mental health. Because it's not accepted. I'm weak. Or, you know, if I say that I'm feeling sad, people will just, they'll look down on me or that I'm not good enough. And so there's still a negative stigma about talking about our emotions, even sharing with a friend. There's still that misconception that if I tell my friend how I'm feeling, feeling that I felt sad or I didn't like something that they may think less of me for that. So I would say that that is still, uh, unfortunately, despite the growth that we're making about awareness, that that perception, that negative stigma is still existing about mental health. And then my last question for you is what advice would you give to someone out there that's struggling with their mental health or what kind of message would you like to leave for our Address Teen Stress audience? Yeah. I would say that you're not alone. You're absolutely not alone, whether it's a social connection that you make online, whether it's listening to a podcast like this, whether it's calling a friend and it could, you know, you may not want to talk about your emotions and that's okay. But I think recognizing that, Hey, what do I need? And I think, you know, the way for us to gain insight into our emo own emotional needs is to think of it like hunger. It's not enough to walk into a restaurant and say, I'm hungry, feed me. It's important for us to know what am I hungry for? What kind of food do I need right now? And that's part of your own mental health journey is to, to understand what are my needs in this moment? Instead of just saying, I'm sad. Okay, that's the first step. But what would you like in this moment? Do you want to be left alone? Do you want a little space to process? Do you want someone just to sit next to you while you you know watch a movie together? Do you want to talk about it? And so that is insight that we all need to learn about ourselves. And so I would say, think of your emotions like hunger, a basic need, and learn to listen to what those emotions are telling you. If it's anger, maybe you feel like no one is listening to you, and that's why we're angry. Maybe you feel like people think your opinions are less than, and that's why you're angry and then that way we can move on to say what would you what what meets that needs how would you like to express that all right thank you so much dr tracy for talking to us about mental health and psychology and your intel with it throughout your professional career as well as thank you so much for helping us address teen stress